there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman of the Football History Dude Podcast, and I'm stopping by this show real quick to tell you about a couple of cool giveaways that we have going on here at the network. Both are autographed books covering various topics of the NFL. The first is The Point After, How One Resilient Kicker Learned There Is More to Life Than the NFL by ex-NFL kicker Sean Conley. It goes over his unique experience as a walk-on kicker at the University of Pitt after never playing high school football. And then it gets into some of his time playing for NFL teams and so much more beyond the gridiron. The other is from author Kevin Bryant. His book is titled Spies on the Sidelines, The High Stakes World of NFL Espionage. This book started as a curiosity, kind of a passion project to understand everything revolving around well, Spygate. But this put Kevin down a rabbit hole learning about all sorts of espionage that has occurred throughout the history of the NFL. Both permissible <laughs> and often the illicit techniques of gathering intel to try to impact the outcome of the game. To sign up for your chance to win an autographed copy of one of these books, all you gotta do is head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways and sign up. That's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash giveaways. Again, check out all the other podcasts that we have in the Sports History Network as well. But now, back to your regularly scheduled journey to the Sports History Timeline. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Now, live and direct from the press box at Old Comiskey Park, it's time for When Football Was Football. Let's join your host, Joe Ziemba, with another forgotten tale from Chicago's pro football history. Let's go! Since the Arizona Cardinals began in 1899, the team has captured just two NFL titles, and both were in the pre-Super Bowl era. In fact, the last championship won by the Cards was in 1947, 75 years ago this season. Unfortunately, that's the longest non-winning title streak by any professional team in any sport. An even more obscure question might be to identify the questions of those two teams. While the name of Jimmy Councilman, who led the Cards to the 1947 title, might be more familiar, especially with his membership in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Recalling the name of the 1925 mentor might be a bit of a challenge. As the years and the decades have swept past the ultimate successes of the Cardinals have largely been forgotten, especially the initial crown that was awarded to the club way back in 1925. In this episode of When Football Was Football on the Sports History Network, We'll examine the unique life of the high school coach who also piloted the Cardinals to the 1925 title while also coaching a local prep team. If that was not enough for this young man, he also coached a military team on the south side of Chicago at the same time, three teams at once. So the subject of our program is Norman Barry, who was so judicious with his time that it's not surprising that he was also an attorney who rose to the position of judge of the Superior Court in Chicago, where he served alongside another Cardinals legend, Judge Duke Slater. Barry's athletic experiences began at the University of Notre Dame, where he was literally a lifer. Back in the early part of the 20th century, Notre Dame also offered educational opportunities at both the grade school and the high school levels including the time Barry spent on campus for his collegiate career and a year in law school, Barry attended school in South Bend, Indiana for a total of 13 years. A native of Chicago, Barry initially made an impact with the Notre Dame football team in 1917. In November of that year, the Indianapolis News reported, Norman Barry, a young Chicago man, was used at right halfback in signal practice. He made several flashy end runs in the fourth quarter against MAC, which is now Michigan State, including a 50-yard jaunt for a touchdown. The Irish finished with a 6-1-1 record in the final year 
of Jess Harper's coaching stint at Notre Dame. Barry was also a member of the Notre Dame track and baseball squads, but his first love was football. During his time at Notre Dame, Barry was a teammate of the infamous George Gipp, the ill-fated running back immortalized by the phrase, win one for the Gipper. In an interview in 1980, Barry fondly recalled Gipp, he said. He was a wonderful guy. He never hurt anybody. He was easygoing. He hung around with older people, with gamblers. He loved to play cards, pool, billiards. And he was good at everything. The two players were so close that Gipp served as the best man at Barry's wedding. Barry and Gipp paced Notre Dame to a 3-1-2 mark in 1918 under new coach Canute Rockney before the team posted identical 9-0 records in 1919 and 1920. Both of those last two seasons brought Notre Dame acclaim as the often-mentioned national champions in the days before playoffs. In the 13-10 win over Indiana on November 13th, Barry was praised for his efforts by the Indianapolis News, which stated, Norman Barry continued his brilliant charging that caused the downfall of Indiana. The Indianapolis Star added, Barry simply ripped and cut his way through obstacles in a manner no Notre Dame man had been able to do. Well, Gipp, of course, was the true star of this team, but the presence of Barry in the backfield provided able blocking and additional rushing power when needed. Following his graduation from Notre Dame in 1921, Barry assisted with spring football drills at the school and continued with his law studies. But in the fall of 1921, Barry was signed by the Chicago Cardinals and played a prominent role in a 27-0 win over the Racine Horlicks. A quote from the Green Bay Gazette said, The end running of Norman Barry, former Notre Dame star, was featured. Then surprisingly, it was announced on October 20th that Barry would leave the Cardinals to focus his efforts solely on coaching De La Salle High School football team in Chicago. This was not an unexpected decision since pro football in 1921 did not offer guaranteed riches or even lasting fame. The league was still struggling to attract both fans and recognition, so it was understandable that Barry would seek a more solid foundation for his coaching career and his future. But then another surprise popped up later when Barry showed up in the lineup for the Green Bay Packers in that team's inaugural NFL season. His impact was immediate, stated the Journal Times, which stated, Norman Barry, Notre Dame's star half, has been doing notable work for Green Bay. Already this season, he has returned two punts for touchdowns. But what was odd about Barry's decision to switch to the Packers was the additional travel load he would absorb. Whereas the Cardinals practiced and played just a few blocks from De La Salle High School, Barry would now need to travel several hours by train for each weekend game. After finishing the 1921 season with the Packers, Barry played very briefly with the Milwaukee Badgers in 1922 before retiring from the playing field. But he continued to coach De La Salle. He remained there for 12 seasons through 1932, compiling a nifty 65-26-6 record, a winning percentage of just over 70%. And from 1922 through 1924, Barry's mark at the high school level was astounding. He was 22-2-2 as he continued to collect Chicago Catholic League championship trophies. Then in 1925, Chris O'Brien offered Barry the opportunity to move on to the National Football League. Barry agreed to helm the cards, but on one condition. He also wanted to retain his head coaching position at De La Salle. With great help from Cardinal assistant coaches Eddie Anderson and Fred Gillies, Barry was able to successfully inhabit both coaching positions at the same time. The Cardinals staged a powerful team in 1925, led by future Hall of Famer Patty Driscoll. Barry, of course, was a very busy man. For example, on November 21, 1925, De La Salle defeated St. Philip 19-0 to capture another Catholic League crown. That was also the date of the last appearance for the legendary Red Grange for the University of Illinois. Grange was the acknowledged superstar on the collegiate level in 1925 
and he signed with the Chicago Bears immediately after his final college game. On Sunday, November 22nd, a day later, Barry led the Cardinals to a 14-0 win over the Dayton Triangles, pushing the Cardinals to an 8-1 record. Just four days later, Grange made his NFL debut against Barry and the Cardinals, with the two Chicago teams battling to a 0-0 tie. The Cards would finish the schedule with an 11-2-1 league record, and the team was awarded the 1925 NFL title. Until Jimmy Councilman finished 11-1 during the 1948 season, this was the best coaching mark in team history up to that point. So, at virtually the same time, Norman Berry won championships at both the high school and the professional levels. But there was still more. Apparently, Berry was also coaching the local 132nd Infantry Football Squad, which certainly must have led to infrequent appearances at home for dinner for the coach during the football season. In 1928, Berry finally took the Illinois bar exam and began moving towards a full-time occupation in the legal field. The Chicago Tribune summarized Berry's fabulous career from that point forward. It said, from 1930 to 1940, he was the attorney for the receiver for closed state banks. He was a lawyer for schools from 1941 to 1953. Barry also served in the Illinois State Senate from 1942 through 53 when he successfully ran for the position of Superior Court Judge. He later became a certain court judge. Upon his retirement in 1978, Norman Barry did not stand still. Instead, he joined the law firm of Rothschild, Barry and Myers. Judge Barry passed away on October 13, 1988 at the age of 89 while still working in his law office. Among the honors he received in his post-football life were being named to the De La Salle High School Hall of Fame, the Chicago Sports Hall of Fame, and the Chicago Catholic League Hall of Fame. In 1988, he was awarded the Distinguished American Award from the National Football Hall of Fame Foundation, and he was also honored by the University of Notre Dame with its highest alumni award, the Edward Frederick Sorn Award. A courtroom at the University of Notre Dame Law School was also dedicated in the name of Norman Barry. In Barry's obituary, his grandson, also named Norman, said, According to what I've heard, he was a hard-nosed player and a hard-nosed coach who stressed the basics. So the ever-moving Norm Barry will certainly remain as the last Cardinals representative to work as both an NFL and high school coach at the same time. His legend will endure as one of only two head coaches to lead the NFL's oldest team to a championship. And that, indeed, ladies and gentlemen, is a rare accomplishment. Thank you for joining us on this episode of When Football Was Football. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. my replica 1909 World Series program poster from Row One Brand. And that's all it took for Marla to do a complete redesign of the Guardian offices, doing up the walls with tremendous prints from baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and more sports events. And every one of them can't help but trigger memories of sports yesteryear. And here's the last one. Let's put it up here by your desk. Perfect. Oh, that's a nice one. College football, 1923, Navy versus Penn State. Do you remember that game, Marla? I sure do. It was October 20th, 1923. Cloudy, but a reasonable 57 degrees at the 2.30 kickoff time. Over 20,000 turned out at Beaver Field in College Station, Pennsylvania for this clash of two of the nation's top teams. The Nittany Lions were the underdogs, despite having won their first three games by a combined score of 94 to nothing. The heavy favorites were the midshipmen, who went on to play in the Rose Bowl after the season. Right, 
and the game immediately became... The entire color of the game would ultimately be dominated by Penn State's star halfback, Harry Wilson, but both offenses took some time to get going for a good 22 minutes before Wilson got the crowd to their feet with an interception of Bill McKee's forward pass, returning it all the way for his first touchdown of the day. Wilson certainly was great On the that. next kickoff, who would end up as returner but Harry Wilson? Wilson dodged at least a half dozen Recall the greatest moments in sports history, or just your own personal favorite, gone from with Row One Brand Sports Paraphernalia. Don't delay. Visit today at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full Row One catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, Telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at checkout. And keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan. When the gun started to mark the end of the game, the score remained Penn State 14, Navy 0. The second half had barely begun when Harry Wilson and Penn State went on to work on Navy again.